Welcome to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. My guest this evening is Comptroller of the State of Connecticut, Kevin Lembo. Lembo. Kevin, welcome. How are you? Great to see you, Pete. It's good to Great be back. Great to see you. So how have you been since the last time we, were, we, were, we sat down together? Well, I, I work at the Capitol, so I think you know the answer to that question. Yeah, <laughs> mm, yeah exactly. Exactly. So last, since last you and I were together, what's been going on? Well, uh, we've had a number of uh, very difficult budget conversations at the okay. Capitol. All right. uh, we have a present year budget that continues to be in deficit despite various attempts to cut it back. And the legislature just finished their business recently and left the Capitol and uh, had to cut hundreds of millions of dollars out of spending in order to bring the new spending plan uh, into balance with uh, the revenue that's coming into the state. And, uh, and I understand that there's also a rainy day fund that works into this whole? Sure, there's about 450 million in the rainy day fund right now. Okay. Uh, and that's really in good budget years, they grab a piece of that and they set it away for the next down economic time and clearly uh, we continue to experience that. So if they need to, they can mm -hmm. lean on that rainy day fund a little bit if necessary. Uh, and when you think about how much time is left in the fiscal year, mm -hmm. uh, it ends June 30th. So there isn't there's... a lot of time if you're going to cut right. uh, to actually realize savings from those cuts. Exactly, and as far as why do you, the, as far as the budget goes and that aspect of things, why do you think it was that difficult of a legislative session this year? Well, look, we're, with each subsequent uh, carving up of okay. the budget, the mm -hmm. difficult decisions that go into cutting programs that we all care about, uh, you have fewer and fewer places to go to find mm -hmm. additional savings. So when you look at the total budget, maybe this much of it is really discretionary. There are things that they can get in there and trim back and do some things with. The rest of it is all committed in one way or another. It's okay. either contractually driven mm -hmm. right. or there are federal requirements that we do certain things or there's education funding. There's a whole bunch of things in there okay. that don't give you a lot of wiggle room. So as that gets bigger and bigger, it crowds that other piece smaller and smaller and they have to keep going back to that same small well uh, to find additional savings. So it's difficult. When you think of a legislator right. who runs in their local community um, and says, I want to go to Hartford and I want to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And then they get there and they realize there isn't the money to do the first this. There isn't the will to do the second this. And the third this is just a, you know, a, a dream. Right. Uh, and they're told to just go in and start finding ways to cut the budget. That's not a very satisfying experience no, uh, for a legislator who's there to do good. I was going to say, it probably doesn't look good as far as a constituent goes and when they come back to after the session's over and they come back into the district and say hey what did you do this session and they come they came back and well I did this 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 and this but I also had to sit down and take a look at the budget and finally decide if cuts had to be made to the local area where they had to be made Right. I had to co cut local funding right. uh, to communities through education cost sharing, for example. Okay. Uh, that leads to potentially an increase in property tax as a result because that's the only place that the cities and towns can go for revenue. Okay. Um, I had to cut programs for domestic violence, for kids with developmental disabilities, for any number of things right. uh, that are really reflections of our values as a state. Um, and unfortunately, those are the places that they had to go and cut. Now, on the flip side of this, mm -hmm. there are ways around this, right? There's a way with some long-term planning to avoid this situation, there is. Uh, but it, it takes a, a lot of will, okay. and once you set the plan, you have to stick to it. So, for example, about two years ago, we put a plan forward uh, that was really all about budget stability. Mm -hmm. It thought about these down economic times and thought about the last economic high that we had. Okay. And historically, Connecticut builds budgets up to the new high mm -hmm. and then cuts them into the hole, okay. raises taxes on the way with it, right. and then builds budgets back up when the market goes up. Okay. So I asked legislators after doing a ton of research and picking the brains of people way smarter than me, mm -hmm. I asked legislators to agree that instead of living in a year or two, yeah. they would look at 10 years of growth okay. right. in our two most volatile tax categories. So those are the corporate tax and the quarterly filer portion of the income tax and agree that we won't budget above a 10-year average growth rate. Now, it sounds like a simple thing, right? You're right. just going to really look at time and figure out exactly. how much you can actually spend. Um, but I have to say, as an Irish-German kid that grew up in an Italian household, right. I had a little bit of agita the day before. Uh, I had to go yeah. to the legislature and say, I want you to tie your hands right. in good economic times so that you don't have to cut programs and raise taxes the next time things go south. Right. I have to say to a legislator, mm. freshman, 
and people who've been there for a long time, House, Senate, Republicans, and Democrats, yep. all said yes. I sat at the Finance Committee with Connecticut Voices for Children on one side of me, arguably a left of center organization, yeah. and the Yankee Institute on the other side of me, arguably a right of center organization, and we were all there to testify in favor of this concept. And so it passed. Okay. It passed into law last year, um, but it doesn't go into effect until 2020. Uh, so um, I've learned in this business that I'm going to take a half or three quarters of a loaf over none. Exactly. Um, right. And uh, we'll just keep working toward it. But those are the kind of things that Connecticut needs to do to bring stability and, frankly, to get Connecticut off the front page of the news story or, or the newspaper right. or over out of the top of the news story on TV every night. Exactly. And I, from what I, let's talk about property tax in, for a little while and the, as far as the effect on the budget goes for your local property taxes and the way it affects your town or you as a citizen. Sure. So depending on the town, yep. uh, there were cuts to the education cost sharing grants. Okay. Uh, there were some other cuts uh, to some of the funding that flows from the state to municipalities. Mm -hmm. Depending on the municipality, they either did better or worse. Um, and as I said, that just leads to an inevitable property tax increase because the only place that a city and town can go to uh, to raise revenue to make up that shortfall yep. is back uh, to the property tax. Now, they did some interesting work around capping motor vehicle property taxes and trying to pass money back down to the towns and cities to sort of balance that all out because right. there's going to be a revenue loss. But when you think about the larger context of this, uh, the economic recovery has not been what anyone would expect. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not anything that we've experienced in the past. Right. And so instead of maybe five years ago setting a rather conservative spending plan mm -hmm. and then being happily surprised when revenue came in above that, we kept like being, I don't know, exuberant and enthusiastic in a way that was irrational. Right. Like somehow this year is going to be the year that revenue is going to come in to cover this, this spending and it just didn't. So the good news is everybody understands that now. Uh, the bad news is it took way too long to get here. Exactly. Now let's go back to motor, ve motor vehicle taxes. How, how does that work? Well, you know, that was all about trying to look at certain communities and the burden that the property tax, particularly mm -hmm. on automobiles, has mm -hmm. and what the mill rate is uh, for those different uh, communities. Okay. And when you think about mill rates in the 70 range versus mm -hmm. the 30 range, you can see that it becomes really hard, uh, particularly in some of our urban centers, uh, to maintain a vehicle in right. those communities. Um, and on the same vehicle, same year, same odometer reading, same value, uh, they were paying exponentially more uh, in taxes, uh, and so there was, they were looking for a way to try to uh, balance that out a little bit and uh, make it fairer if they could. Say, I was going to so. say, and that probably doesn't make the person getting the bill too happy. Well, I mean, <laughs> ultimately it means that if, if you're one of those people in those communities that's mm -hmm. got higher taxes on their, their car, you'll see a decrease. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, but that's offset by yeah. <laughs> lots of other stuff mm -hmm. that's going on. So are you net up or down? That always remains the question. Exactly, exactly. And for viewers and listeners that don't know who Kevin Lembo is, and we actually didn't do that this at the beginning of the segment, Kevin Lembo is the comptroller for the state of Connecticut. How long have you been comptroller? This is my sixth year. Really? Uh, so I'm in my second year, four-year term. Okay. Uh, we run every four years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have many responsibilities, including paying the state's employees, paying the state's bills, keeping the state's books, uh, buying health care for about 210,000 people, uh, administering the pension benefit for our retirees. but. The unofficial title of the office is the one that weighs most heavily on my shoulders, and that is the state's fiscal guardian. So, as you can imagine, so in bad economic all. times, you know it's it's hard to feel like you're guarding uh, the finances. Exactly, and I'm sure I'm sure during the budget session and the legislative session this year, that probably wasn't a fun job. You probably, no, because, you probably didn't enjoy it because while I don't get a vote on the budget, right. um, we a are asked for input. Uh, on different ideas that come up during okay. the, the course of the legislative year. Uh, but it's hard sometimes to see well-intended but bad ideas be put in place mm -hmm. uh, when you know what the downstream impact is going to be. So for example, yep. in the cutting that's been done in the budget for next year, right. there could be 2,000 people laid off out of state government. Really? So if you're an individual who mm -hmm. you know dislikes government, always thinks less is more when it comes to employees, then right. you may be happy about that. 
Uh, but when you think about it selfishly, what that means is 2,000 or maybe more of our neighbors, people we know from church or the mm -hmm. grocery store or the PTA who are suddenly going to be out of work in a tiny state like Connecticut, and ultimately, uh, they're going to stop paying income taxes, right. so there'll be less revenue. They're going to need unemployment compensation benefits, so there'll be a draw on right. that. Right. And then if it goes on for too long, suddenly you see real estate markets destabilize again as people go into short sales and foreclosures. So mm -hmm. suddenly we think it doesn't impact us when it does. Uh, for every one public sector employee that gets laid off, mm -hmm. the analysis is that half of a full-time equivalent, a half of an employee Correct. outside of government also loses their job because there aren't the financial inputs, the economic inputs right. uh, no longer happen. So the dry cleaner, you yep. know, the kid who's working at the pizza joint, mm -hmm. you, know, you end up seeing people lose additional jobs exactly. uh, because of the lack of uh, employees. Exactly, and we, we talked about this uh, earlier and you said that the, we're in the middle to the end of the fiscal year of this year. That's how's, right. How's the state looking for fiscal next year is still in going to be rough shape. Well, the budget that they just passed, yeah. um, and it wasn't easy to get it done, but they mm -hmm. did, uh, brings the budget into balance for next year based on the revenue forecasts that we already have. So, right. um, so that means that the budget is technically balanced for next year Excellent. right now, uh, but this is not a one and done. You know, you have to ride herd over this thing throughout mm -hmm. the, the entire period. Right. Um, and this, so this year will be about 250 million in the hole. Okay. They can draw out of the rainy day fund if they need to. Okay. And Right now, next year looks balanced, but there's a lot of economic assumptions in the revenue forecast that lead you to budget building. And if those prove not to be true, then you're going to see the governor and the legislature have to make additional cuts to the budget, um, which will be very difficult. I was going to say, which would probably not be, because then you got to decide where to make the cuts from right. as far as what services to cut or what aid to cut to your local towns or municipalities. Uh, right, and there's, and there's really nowhere else to go at right. this point. I really would argue that, particularly cuts to the nonprofit community, mm -hmm. that many are serving people that the state of Connecticut would have to serve itself if not for that nonprofit. Right. You can only cut them so far before they can't make payroll and suddenly you have an agency you know, go out of business or potentially right. uh, go out of business. So you know, we have to think long and hard about what that means because ultimately the state will have to step back in and provide service for these people directly if not for the existence of those nonprofits. And I was going to say, I didn't realize that non, not as far as a nonprofit goes, that they're affected by the state because obviously that's where they get most of some of their funding from. They get some, certainly. And you know, they'll often say, well, go back out and raise the money to do it. Um, but it's not that easy. No, it's uh, we all know, anybody who's involved with any nonprofit in their community knows mm -hmm. that raising money right now is difficult uh, and largely because of the uncertainty that we're feeling in the economy and that disposable income in some households simply isn't there. Kevin Lemo, would you mind sticking around for another segment? Happy to. We'll be right back. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. And welcome back to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. Sitting here with State Comptroller Kevin Lumbo. Kevin, welcome back. Happy to be here. Happy to have you here. Thanks. So let's talk about prescription drugs. Sure. And as far as that aspect of the state goes, let's 
Yeah, yeah. So um, we talked a little bit in the last segment about sort of that budget stability uh-huh, proposal. Yeah. So I really feel like when I first was elected, I said it was my job to flip the sofa cushions looking for change, right? All because right. it was like <laughs> such economic times we were trying to really find. Yeah. And now I'm looking at the big chunks of the budget, that mm-hmm. big section we talked about earlier, yeah. not so much the little section, yeah, yeah, yeah. and trying to figure out how do we wrangle these costs, make them more predictable, and if we can, squeeze them down. So mm-hmm. uh, in that, under that same banner, I buy the state employee retirement health plan and right. there are also some municipalities uh, that participate in that plan as well and what we've done over the last couple of years is put a health enhancement program in place mm-hmm. really driving toward uh, better outcomes for our participants and trying to make sure that we're putting our health care dollars in the right places right. not just like opening the barn door and you know letting everything just run wild right because we have a fiduciary responsibility to the people of the state mm-hmm. to make sure that this is a highly efficient program that we're running uh, and so we were watching our medical trend okay so the cost sure. that it, it what it costs us each year to provide mm-hmm. health care and we've actually taken that number from at one point double digit increases year okay. over year yep. to single digits I think right now we're like 2.6 or 2.9 percent growth rate and that's really exemplary right now especially when you look at other plans that are seeing growth rates of you know 10 12 15 in some cases percent year over year uh-huh. But then when you look at the pharmacy spend, our pharmacy trend was 20%. Okay. So you start digging down in that and you see a couple of categories of things. One is, well, yeah, there are new medications, good medications that are going to make a difference in people's lives. And I would point to the new treatment for hepatitis C as Mm -hmm. one of those. Life-changing for a lot of people. But then we saw this other category called compound drugs. And I have to say, I wasn't quite sure what this was until we started doing the research, but you know, historically, a pharmacy can compound a medication, okay. and it's mostly used for a kid who's allergic to the red dye in the cough syrup, okay, right? Yeah. An elderly person who can't swallow a pill, and mm-hmm. so they put it in a different form so right. they can get it in. But because of changes in Washington, these compound pharmacies have set up a whole new network of themselves. So it's not our mom and pop pharmacies that we think of in town. No. Um, and they are combining multiple medications into one. Okay. There's no outside proof that they do anything. They're taking a little bit of this pain medication, a little bit of ketamine, a little bit of something else, putting it all in and then telling you, well, you've got a pain on your knee, just rub this on your knee, it's gonna make everything better. And hmm. in some cases, the cost is like sixteen thousand dollars. You know, so it's wow. it's crazy. So That's we had to do something about it. Right. Um, and uh, we did our research. We checked with pharmacists. We tried to figure out who were the good guys, who were the bad guys, and realized that this is happening all around the country. That these companies come in, they do business for a little while, they extract as much money as they can out of the system, and then they move on to the next community after you do your best to shut them down. And so we put a simple prior authorization in place. Mm -hmm. We had gone from about $800,000 in compound drugs, traditional compounds, Uh to 24 million. As soon as we put the prior authorization in place, back down to 800,000. They they just have disappeared essentially from the market. Um, But that means they moved on to somewhere else. But Mm -hmm. my job is to make sure that this plan runs well. And Um, how's the plan going so far? It's going really well. Is Um, it? uh, Doctors, hospitals, patients, all engaged in their care, or in some cases in their own care. Uh Uh, We're seeing our diabetic patients, our patients with cardiac issues, our high cholesterol patients, all getting the care that they need, when they need it, not waiting. Our well employees are getting their screenings when they need to. Because really what you want is if someone's gonna have a medical issue, Mm -hmm. you want them to catch it on a regular basis at a routine medical visit and not wait till it starts presenting some terrible thing. Because in in that case, you take a stage one cancer, for example, Mm -hmm. and make it a three or four stage cancer. And that means it's more expensive to treat, and the cure rate is a lot lower. So um, it was interesting, you know, mammograms for our female employees, mm-hmm. uh, uh, colonoscopies for all of our employees over a certain age. Uh, people get very sort of nervous about this stuff, but we've incentivized it in a way um, that it's in their best interest to do it, and it saves the plan a ton of money in the process. I was going to say, you said you, it's an, you've incentivized it. 
So what are some of the incentives? Yeah, well, we're limited because it's a collectively bargained plan, meaning uh -huh. labor and management have to negotiate for the plan. Mm -hmm. But you get discounts on your premium if you do this. You avoid deductibles if you do this. And if you're in one of five chronic disease states, the medical literature is clear. If you take all the barriers between a person and their medication, yep. especially a chronically ill person, you save tons of money downstream because they maintain wellness a lot longer. And so, you know, we waive copays on certain generic drugs just because it's in our financial interest to do it. And we're saving the taxpayers money as a result. Exactly. That sounds like a pretty, pretty nice program to be involved with. It was one of those things, Peter, where all the literature, all of the science mm -hmm. said this is the way to go. But until you actually do it in the lab, yep. until you actually do it with real live employees, exactly. we held our breath a little bit. Uh, but I have to give uh, the state employee uh, labor unions, the okay, public sure. employee labor unions, and yep. the governor's office some credit uh, for agreeing uh, with one another that this was the right thing to do. And they both agreed that it was, it was the right they thing did. to do. They actually everything. negotiated it, and that's what we're implementing. Really? And that's implemented right now? Yes, and it's been in place for a number of years now. So we have nice banks of evidence uh, to, to support where it's we're It's actually headed. working and things Absolutely are right. Saving go. money and we have better outcomes. I was going to say, how much money do you, do you think we've saved, give, give or take? Oh, there was one year that we saved. At the very first year, there yeah. was 30 million and then another 30 million, and then it was like $100 million savings. Uh, and then what happens, though, is uh -oh. you know the budget catches up. So mm -hmm. the legislature stops giving you as much money because they realize you don't need as much exactly. anymore. But that, that's a happy problem. All right, that's yeah. definitely a happy problem. Now, as far as, and I was doing some research, let's talk about, I guess, you and Charles are adoptive parents? We are. So uh, we adopted originally uh, in 1990, 91. Okay. So our oldest is now 31, our second is 28, and our youngest is 16. Um, and I always joke that even though I think I do a pretty good job uh, as comptroller, <laughs> mm. um, I think I'm a better dad. I think that, <laughs> and that feels more real to me, frankly, because exactly. we've just talked for the last however many minutes about 30,000 foot policy stuff. Right. Um, so, you know, being down on the ground with a kid, teaching them colors and trying to teach them to count, you know, that feels really real. I was going to say, well, let's, for, we talked about policy and state stuff. Let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about this for a few minutes. So, uh, so we decided that what we would do was become foster parents uh, and we're uh, providing foster care uh, on a short-term basis mostly emergency um, yeah, and uh, zero to four is our age group all right um, and uh, I was saying earlier that raising toddlers is a younger man's game uh, mm -hmm. but I'm doing my best to hang in there uh, <laughs> the one day uh, we had two toddlers at the house uh, I had them over at a track meet because our 16 year old was running okay. uh, and then had to give speech that night and when I got out of the car at the venue to give the talk I looked down and I had banana <gasps> smeared down the side of my oh, and I no. realized this oh. is what a dad looks like exactly. uh, <laughs> so, hmm. uh, but it's good um, is it and it's important work um, and you know sometimes kids enter the foster care system for lots of reasons it's exactly. never their fault no um, and uh, they really need a, a little bit of an island of calm uh, instability in a very chaotic situation. So we're working hard to not only do this, but also to encourage others to think about it, to think about becoming a foster parent because we need more foster parents um, and uh, you can really provide uh, an amazingly important gift uh, to a child in this great state of ours if you, you choose to do it. So if your listeners are thinking in any mm -hmm. way that this might be for them, mm -hmm. I would encourage them to call the 1-800-KID-HERO number okay. or contact DCF and at least start asking questions. Uh, right. Don't put it aside and say, I'll think about this again tomorrow. Now, what is it, now when you figure out if you want to be a foster parent, what are some of the questions you want to ask yourself? Well, you know, often people will think it's all about time, uh, but I joke that if you want something done, ask a busy person, right? So <laughs> yeah, exactly. most of us have figured out how to juggle career and home. And mm -hmm. uh, so there's niches for everyone. You know, sometimes there's longer term foster placements, which require a different kind of commitment. Sometimes they're shorter term. Sometimes it's mentorship. Sometimes it's respite, meaning a couple of nights here or there. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's really room for everybody. Uh, if you've got room in your heart, uh, and a little bit of patience, uh, I think uh, there, there's an opportunity uh, for you. I was going to say, and wh wh I guess, why did you, why did you and Charles decide you wanted to become foster parents? Well, um, I, I've been encouraging other state employees in. Uh, 
May, which is National Foster Care Awareness Month, and okay. again in November when we have uh, National Adoption Awareness Month, okay. uh, to consider doing this. So I send out an email to all of our employees, and then I realized I needed to put my money where my mouth is. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it's been an interesting journey. Uh, there's a considerable amount of training. It's not mm -hmm. like you just walk in and sign your name and they hand you a child and you go back to your car. Uh, you, know, you have to go through training and screening, uh, but uh, it's... Again, it's important, okay. um, and I feel like we have the time right now, uh, even though we don't have a ton of it. Right. Uh, we have the time, the energy, and I think the skill uh, to, to do this and to do it right. So, um, so we'll see how it goes. All right. I was actually going to ask, what is some of the training that you've, you've had to go through to? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. The, uh, the training is about 13 weeks. Okay. Uh, you meet weekly for a couple of hours. Um, and they've acknowledged and recognized that um, even the youngest child that enters foster care um, has experienced some level of trauma. Uh, you know, being taken away from their family, even if they don't actually know who's who, right. they recognize smells and sounds and things, and it can be traumatic for them. So everything that you do as a foster parent is uh, acknowledging, mm -hmm. uh, A, that this child has been through trauma, right. and sometimes kids who've been through trauma do things that don't seem normal or right. ordinary or not in our experience. Um, and then the other thing to really think about is that the primary goal of foster care is reunification. And that's hard because sometimes we have our own judgments about should this child go back or not. Right. Um, and it's an important exercise uh, to sort of go through that, be part of a team, uh, but understand that there are other people that are going to make that decision. It's not yours as the foster parent. Um, and that your job is to really be there front and center for that kid and be their advocate um, and their ally um, right. when they need one. So, I was going to say the screening process probably isn't that, that, that easy. Uh, you know, it's, it's thoughtful, um, and I think if you're committed to it, um, you have to be able to get through the training. Uh, right. I think if you can get to the training, that's sort of the first bar to jump over. Um, <laughs> and then after that, um, it's actually being there and doing the job of being the foster parent. So okay. I don't know how long we'll do it. We'll do it for as long as it seems right, All and right. as long as we feel like we're making a difference. And, Excellent. Uh, again, I hope others will consider it. I was going to say, you feel like you're making a difference? I hope so. I'm hearing from DCF that more and more folks are uh, calling and asking for information, so that's a good first step. Excellent. Kevin Lembo, thanks for coming down. We'll see you soon. Good to see you, Pete. All right. On behalf of Kevin Lembo and Pete Mazzetti, thanks again, and we'll see you next week.